Muy buenas tardes, un saludo al misionero Miguel Bermúdez Marín. Allá en Good afternoon. Ciudad Guatemala, Guatemala. Greetings to the missionary Miguel Bermúdez Marín there in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And all those who are gathered there with him. On this occasion, international ministers and local ministers as well, and the congregation there, where our brother Eduardo Cubur pastors, and also for those who are watching us through the satellite Amazonas or the internet in different countries, and to those who are here who are visiting us from different countries as well, and those from here from Puerto Rico, and those who are here for the first time on this occasion in this place here, in the Great Tent Cathedral. Today, Friday, April 7th of this year, 2023. May the blessings of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who gave his life for each one of us on a day like today be upon each and every one of us, you and me as well. And may God on this occasion open our understanding the scripture to us to understand his program for this end time. In his eternal and glorious name as son of David, William, King of kings and Lord of lords, amen and amen. On a day like today, Christianity is commemorating that important moment of the crucifixion of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, for which let us read a portion of the scripture, some verses of the scripture, that he in this message the mystery of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, preached on Friday, April 10th, 1998, here in Calle, Puerto Rico. He used the scripture of the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 27, verse 35 to 53. And let us read from verse 45 where it tells us. Now, from the sixth hour, and he writes 11 to 12, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, from 2 to 3 p.m., he wrote there, 2 to 3 p.m. In other words, more or less at this time, almost 3 p.m. Close to the hour. In other words, it was almost 3 in the afternoon. The day was normal, but notice that darkness began to come at an hour that is very difficult for that to happen. But something very important was happening in the divine program. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, the mystery of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may please be seated in the message the history of the seventh seal, the mystery that we need to know, preached on October 15, 1999 in Lima, Peru. It says, 
And now, since the Word will become flesh, the Word will become flesh at the last day, the veil of flesh where the Word will become flesh, for how long will it be a secret? That will be a secret for a period of time until the Word is made flesh and is being fulfilled and it is in its ministry. In other words, the beginning, as the Reverend William Branham says, will be a complete mystery. In other words, no one is going to imagine such a thing. Then, when his ministry has already begun, and has shown the promises of the coming of the Lord, of the coming of the Messiah, and saying the people, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your ears, identifying himself as the fulfillment of the promise of the coming of the Messiah. On some occasions, he would also say to his disciples, Do not say that I, Jesus, am the Christ, in other words, the Messiah, the Anointed One. In the message, the indictment, our brother Branham tells us on page 27, he says, the church hated him. Why? He was their very God. They hated him and denied him to be their Messiah. No, sir, they didn't want such a Messiah as that. And today the church does the same thing. It denies the word, and he writes the word. They do not want it. It's contradictory to what they've been taught to believe by their creeds. And he also writes, They denied their Messiah. The Messiah equals the Word. And the Word is the Messiah. Do you believe that? Well, the reflection of the Word then is what? A reflecting a Messiah, which is the Holy Ghost among us. And he writes, Revelation 7.1, 7, 2, 1, 1, 19, verse 10. He's reflecting himself, and he writes there, reflect the Messiah. He's reflecting himself, tries to, wherever he can, find a lamp that he can look through, that ain't smoke up with creeds and things. He can give light through. Remember, they rose and trimmed their lamps and washed out the chimneys, but it's too late. So when a man sees the, these Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, trying to come in these last days to receive the Holy Ghost, why, you know, they don't get it. Well, they might speak in tongues and jump up and down, but watch what happens. They absolutely, it's a time sign that she's over. He writes, a sign that the time is over. We are at the end. Most any time, the church could hear the challenge to Come on high. And he draws a cornerstone and an arrow. And he writes, The challenge, come up hither. Amen. Just exactly setting just in order. The Holy Spirit here making Jesus Christ a reality through the ones that he can work through, proving himself. Come down, takes his picture, shows it, makes science take, talk about it, and everything else, proving just exactly what he said he would do, doing exactly the things he said he would do, scripturally. Now, not some creed or some man's worked-up idea, a lot of blood, fire, 
and smoke and stuff, but a scriptural messianic evidence. And there he draws a Star of David. Got a lot of impersonation and impersonators and so forth. But that only makes the real word shine its best. That's right. Let people who are spiritual, who can judge between right and wrong, see? And he writes, the impersonators. Denies him. Deny him their Messiah. We didn't want him. And the same thing they do today. Well, if I had to go down there and act like that bunch, I don't want it at all. All right, then you don't have it at all. That's all, see? Same now. And he writes, they denied their Messiah. Although he was properly identified, they didn't want him. And he draws a star of David and he writes, identified. They didn't want him. They hated him. Why was it? We called their pastors a bunch of snakes. He said, you bunch of witted walls. You're nothing but a graveyard. The outside of you is polished with robes and turned around collars. And the inside is dead man's bones. He didn't pull no punches. One little bitty Galilean, a carpenter's son, but he didn't pull no punches. He told them, don't think John said, the forerunner of him said, his another didn't pull any punches. He said, don't come around here saying how you got Abraham to our father. And he write, they did not pull punches. God is able of this stone to raise children to Abraham. Yes, sir. The axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that doesn't bring forth fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Yes, sir. God is strict, is firm and stern with his word. Notice. Jesus, proven by the scripture, do you hear me? Jesus was identified by God through the scripture that he was Messiah. And he draws a star of David and he writes, identified. Is that right? We'll get to Peter's indictment in a few minutes and you'll find out whether it was or not. He was truly identified that he was God manifested in a man called the Son of God. In the book of quotations, on page 123, he says, in paragraph 1096, Now, notice now, as he came, he had to come as the Son of Man, because the Holy Scripture said that he would. God would raise up a prophet to them. So, he could not come calling himself the Son of God, because it wasn't that dispensation. He was the Son of Man prophesying to fulfill and revealing to them all the things that had been done, and type what he was. Then he was on earth as son of man. Look at that Seraphinician woman run to him, said. There he writes, types, revealing to them the types and figures that spoke of him. Run to him and said, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He never as much as raised his head. She had no claim on him as son of David. She was a Gentile. No more than my daughter has claim on me as husband or my wife as daughter. Yet she is my daughter and my wife. 
She is my daughter in the gospel, but earthly, she has no right to call me a father. See, now notice this gentile woman had no claim on him as son of David, but blind Bartimaeus did. See, he was Jew. Now he came as son of man. You have to know these words and these things. Look at Hattie Wright that time when the third pool. You remember it? Of all the everything, that woman said the right thing. You've got to say the right word, the right thing to God. Notice, now, he came first as the prophet, and they crucified him. His own crucified him. He came as the Son of Man. Then, after the Holy Spirit came, he was then the Son of God. God is a spirit. In other words, that was in the dispensation of grace. He was the Holy Spirit, Son of God. He lived through the church ages as Son of God. Now, in the millennium, he'll be Son of David. And remember that it is already in a new dispensation, the dispensation of the kingdom, where he will come as son of David. Now, and remember, between the son of God in the Laodicean church age, they put him out. And in look, he said he would be revealed again as son of man, the prophet, fulfilling the rest of it, see? He is revealed in the last days as son of man. According to Malachi 4, all the rest, the prophecies pertaining to this hour. And there he writes, Son of David, for Jews. Son of, at the bottom he writes, Son of God equals the Holy Spirit, equals in the ages. And also writes, the son of David equals in the millennium. Our brother William continues to say here in this message, there were stages under the ministry of Jesus where the disciples had to keep it secret. They could not be proclaiming him that way in some stages or moments because there was danger. The scripture says that on one occasion, they said to Jesus, look, Herod is looking for you to kill you. On another occasion, when Herod killed John the Baptist, Jesus left that territory because the next one, the next one the king would be looking for to kill would be Jesus. Jesus was careful because he could not die in just any time, but in the time appointed by the scripture. Now on page 124, notice he tells us something there, a uh, reference to Moses, who had a very important work, and nothing could touch him. Notice on page 124, Paragraph 1105 says, Wherever the word is, it's veiled. Moses had the word. And he writes, Moses was the word for the people. And he also writes, The Age and Dispensation. Now remember, after the word was made manifest, Moses was Moses again, see? But while that word was in him to be given out, he was God. Well, he wasn't Moses no more. He had the word of the Lord for that age. Nothing could touch him till that was over. He had the word, and he was the word to them. And he draws a star of David, and he writes Revelation 19, 10-21. And a slightly bigger star of David, 
but drawn in blue ink. And he also writes, Revelation 11, 3 to 6, below. He writes, nothing could touch him. And on top, he says, nothing could touch him until he finished the work. The word veiled in human flesh in Moses. He also writes that there. But notice, Jesus was careful because he could not die in it just a, any time, but in the time appointed by the scripture. It has to be the evil Passover, not just any Passover, but the Passover corresponding to God's program for the death of Jesus to carry out the work of redemption on Calvary's cross. Jesus' death in another time will have no value. It would have no prophetic value to fulfill the work of the sacrifice represented in the sacrifices that the Hebrew people performed. That is why the enemy of God wanted, by means of the instrument he had, King Herod and other instruments, to kill Jesus. But notice, Christ said, No one takes my life. I lay it down myself that I may take it again. Now, we can see that God had a program and he was carrying it out through Jesus. And there were times when Jesus did not even appear to be the Messiah. There were times when he didn't even appear to be the Messiah, but he was the Messiah. Now, Christ opened that mystery to his disciples, to the believers in him. But even though it was open, they did not understand all the work he was carrying out. And on some occasions, some wanted to crown him and proclaim him king, and he would leave their midst. That's when he performed the miracles of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. The disciples of Jesus Christ did not know the divine program that was being carried out in Jesus. They knew he was the Messiah, the Son of God, but they did not know the whole program that he would carry out to bring to perfect realization the redemption of the human being. And now, we do not know all the details of all that divine program of the second coming of Christ. But we do know that every part of the divine program corresponding to the second coming of Christ for our transformation will be fulfilled. And now, as God is opening the scriptures and opening the mystery of the seventh seal, we are obtaining the knowledge of the mystery that we need to know. And in the message, the word made flesh that our brother William preached here in June 2nd, 1985, here in Calle, Puerto Rico, he tells us, They only had the letter. They had the Old Testament, but they did not have the knowledge of what that meant for those days. They did not understand that there was the Word in their midst, the Word in flesh, the Word made flesh among them, which was completely Emmanuel, God with the Hebrew people in those days but they did not understand it. He came to his own, and his own received him not, because they did not understand, they did not comprehend that that young man raised in Nazareth was the man they were waiting for in the fulfillment of the divine promises. They began to look for faults in him instead of looking for the fulfillment of the divine promises that were being carried out in him in those days. Instead of looking for and seeing the Spirit of God that was upon him, doing the works that corresponded to that time, they began to look for things in him that were not what they should be looking for, in the man they were waiting for. In this message, the indictment on page 
22. Page 23, he says, That's exactly what they do today. And upon this ground, upon the grounds of crucifying Christ, upon the grounds of taking the word and taking it away from the people, is exactly what they were doing there. Taking the word away from the people. That is what they were doing back then. The very word that God was reflecting through his own son to prove it was he writes reflect and the one that they claim that they loved the Jehovah that had manifested himself by the scriptures done exactly what he said he would do exactly what God said he would do and reflected it before them because the love of their church groups and things like that they condemned the prince of life. And I condemn the same group today and indict them as guilty before God by the word of God that they are doing the same thing. This generation is indicted. Now in the message, leadership on page 21 he says see you must accept that person of eternal life you must accept that person of eternal life and he writes the angel of the covenant and to the side he draw a star of David and he writes you must accept the person of eternal life now, what life Luther had was justification. Wesley had sanctification added to it. The Pentecost had the restoration of the gifts coming back in it, added to it. But now, it's completing in the body, you see, the three phases of it. And out of that, then when the resurrection comes, and in when the resurrection comes, he drew a cornerstone and an arrow toward there and the ages and the last three. Then when the resurrection comes, and where does it come? To the cornerstone. The life that lived in them Lutherans that went out, the life that lived in the Methodists and went out, the life that went into the Pentecostals will all be raptured out of the ground in the body of the bride to be taken in before Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Oh, it's exciting. It's the truth. We've turned a corner. We're looking toward heaven, watching for the coming. And he draws a cornerstone in the ages and an arrow toward the cornerstone. The cap of the pyramid, as we would say, he's coming back. We have turned a corner, he also writes there. The church must be resurrected soon, and we must get ready. And the only way you can is not say, well, I belong to the assemblies, I belong to the unionists, tunas, or whatever it is, all them there. I belong to the church of God. That doesn't mean a thing. Our father shouted and danced. That's just perfectly all right. That was their day. But today you're confronted not with the organization that they made, but with the life that's going on, which is Jesus Christ. And he draws an arrow toward the cornerstone. And on the other page, on 22, he also draws the cornerstone and the ages and draw an arrow toward the cornerstone. In other words, today, in the present day, in this present time, is when 
you are confronted with the word, he says, not with the organizations that they made, but with the life that's going on, which is Jesus Christ. This young fellow had done the same thing. Moses wrote those commandments, but you see, the same God who wrote the commandments by his prophet was the same thing that prophesied the day would come. I'll raise up a prophet likened unto me, and it'll come to pass that all that don't hear him will be cut off. Back in the denomination of shucks and tassels, they must go on to life. And today, don't say, I'm Pentecost, I belong to this, I belong to that. That don't mean nothing. You've got to accept the person, Christ, eternal life. And he draws an arrow and the drawing of the cornerstone and the ages and the arrow toward the cornerstone. Confront every one of us. Don't forget that. The other leaders, you see, they have such a hold on him. Their people is taught, well, we belong to this, we belong to that, and has such a hold of him. But what a fatal thing to reject the leadership of eternal life. Now, that life is present tonight. That's right. The Holy Spirit is here, which is Christ in spirit form. His spirit, the anointing, is here. In other words, it is like when the angel of the covenant was working in the Old Testament from age to age and from dispensation to dispensation, he was passing from one messenger to another. And it is so in the ages in the New Testament. He continues saying here in the message, the indictment, Remember, I'm on page 19. Remember Hebrews 13.8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How did they in indict him? Because that their creeds would not accept him. And down in their hearts, they know different. Did not Nicodemus in the third chapter of St. John well expressed it? Rabbi, We, the Pharisees, the preachers, the teachers, we know your teacher is sent from God. For no man could do the things that you do unless God was with him. See? They publicly witnessed it by one of their of renowned men. And because of their creeds, they crucified Christ. And today, There is not a reader that cannot read Acts 2.38, the same I can read it, and the rest of it, just the same as I can read it. But because of their creeds and because of their denominational tickets that they got in their pockets, the mark of the beast that they're packing around as fellowship cards, and he writes, the tickets, the mark of the beast. And taking those things, they crucified to themselves Jesus Christ the fresh and crucified him before the public and blaspheme. And he writes, blaspheme. Blaspheme the very God that promised to do this, bringing damnation upon the race. And he writes, damnation. Now there, they, not the sinners, they, that is, the church of that day, they found fault with the man who was the Word. And he writes, they found fault in the man who was the Word. Is that right? They found fault with the man who was the Word. Now, they find fault with the Word working through man. See? They just vice versa it which is in the person this the Holy Spirit is working through, is God's vindication. How did they know he was Christ? Because his works proved that he was, he said. 
Which of you can condemn me of sin if I haven't done just exactly what the Scripture said I would do? And which? Somebody tell me where I failed somewhere if I haven't shown every sign that I am the Messiah, that I am the very one that you promised. Said, they said, well, we have Moses. We believe Moses. Said, if you would believe Moses, you believe me. If you, Moses, seen my day and desired to live in this day, Moses seen afar off and the prophets, and here you are living right by it and condemned, said, you hypocrites, said, you can discern the face of the skies, but the sign of the time you can't discern. There it is, the sign of the time. What did it class him? A fanatic, a crazy man. Yet yeah, they found fault with the man who was the Word. He was the Word. St. John, first chapter, proves that In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. He was the living Word of God, because He was expressing God through Himself. He was so completely to surrendered to the Word of God till He and the Word was the same. And he writes, reflect. And that's exactly what the church ought to be today, that the Word of God is the same. How can you be part of that Word when you deny practically all of it? And the reason it's done is not because the people. That's the reason I think God spoke to me about calling His people the Rikis and the Riquetas. It's because of this selfish denomination had got these people living out there in the way they're living. Let's continue reading. They've crucified the truth, and the people call it a blasphemy, and they make it blasphemy. And he writes, blasphemy. They call it fanatism and so forth, and not knowing that they're blaspheming the very God that they got to church to serve. Therefore, I indict this bunch of clergy today. I indict this generation in the name of Jesus Christ under the authority of God's word. You are crucifying him again. And he writes, the vindicated word. And on the other side, he writes, God in the flesh. Notice, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's Word is vindicated in a man. Compare the two Calvaries and their accusations. Remember, because he made himself God, we will not have this man rule over us. That is what they said. What was the accusation that they could find in the council that morning when they crucified Jesus? That he made himself God. And he writes, God made flesh. He was God. And he broke the Sabbath. And he writes, the age of Laodicea. And he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Laodicea. That is, he wrote Laodicea there. They condemned him because that he made himself God. You have no right to do this. You have no right. Our high priest, if anything is coming, comes through our priests. Now, compare that with the Calvary today. When God it so pleased the Father, God the Spirit, to raise up His own Son, overshadowed the Mary by the Holy Spirit and brought forth a body that could serve Him and serve His purpose to He. The God was in Christ, the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Him, reflecting what God was to the people. The deity in flesh, he writes there, and here he writes, reflect letting the whole world know what God wanted 
each individual to be, a son and a daughter. He took man and did it. And because that he didn't join with their organizational ranks, they condemned him and crucified him. He goes on to say here, in this message, the word made flesh, he says. But people will always find what they are looking for. Since the people were looking for faults, defects, then they began to see that Jesus ate and drank with publicans. They began to see that he also ate and drank, and they said, This is a man who eats and drinks wine. And that is not the way the ministers of our time are. That is not the way the Levites are. We indeed say that this man is Samaritan. This man is neither a Levite nor a Hebrew. This man is a Samaritan and is mad and has demons. That is what they said about the word made flesh because they could not see the divine program that was being carried out in that man called Jesus of Nazareth. They could not realize that when a prophet appears on earth, he does not appear to please the religions or the great religious leaders, nor the small ones either. A prophet does not come to be an instrument, a toy of the religions, or to do what they want, but he comes to fulfill the divine plan and purpose for the day God sent him. And when a prophet appears on earth, that is the word made flesh in a man. When that word appears coming from the sixth dimension, from the dimension of theophany, and becomes flesh in a man, then we have the visitation of God to fulfill the program that God has for those days. And for God to speak through that veil of flesh what people need to hear from God. And God does nothing outside that veil of flesh in whom the Word is incarnate. God speaks nothing to the human beings outside that veil of flesh. And he who understands it well and receives him will be a blessing to him. Because he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's mercy. He receives all the blessings that God has promised for that time, which he fulfills through that messenger. But he who rejects him, he writes three dots. When a message of God appears, it always appears through a man, because the word incarnate is in that man. And when they take that man to mock him, they're not mocking the man, but God. When they mock that man, they are not mocking man, but God. When the prophet Samuel was rejected by the people of Israel, and he wept and told God that they had rejected him, God said to him, They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. This is how it is when the word becomes flesh. It comes for the blessing of some and curse for others. Because when the word becomes flesh on this planet earth, life and death are before the human being. And now notice in this same message, the indictment on page 36, it says, Notice this. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. What they do? What? By having a taste and knowing that it's the truth and then turn around and denying it. What it do? It's impossible. And he writes, they crucify the Son of God by denying him. So that's what this nation has done. That's what this people has done. That's what these churches has done. They've turned it down. And they've crucified the message. They've crucified the truth to the people. How'd they do Jesus? They put him to shame. Stripped his clothes off of him. 
And he writes, they crucified the message. Hung him up on a cross and nailed him up there. The Prince of Life. The same thing they've done today with their creeds. They've done the same thing. They stripped the thing. They've stripped the go goodness and the clothing of the gospel by trying to place it somewhere else and hung him on a cross. Oh my, why? And he writes, the clothing equals the gospel. There, they crucified. Now the last quotation, him, him the most precious person. Why they do it? They didn't know him. Why they doing it today? They don't know this is the truth. They're dumb and blind of it. They do not know it. That's the reason. Their creeds and traditions have gotten them away from the word of God. Now, our brother William continues saying, and the greater the manifestation of the word in human flesh is, the more he manifests himself in his fullness, the greater the problems are, the persecutions are, the reproaches are, and all the bad things that the human being raised against the word in human flesh. Because faith in the word made flesh does not belong to everyone. Faith in the word made flesh is not for everybody. Not everyone can understand that this is what was announced that God would carry out. And since God does nothing except through human flesh, through a prophet, that is why he had to send a prophet, a messenger, for each age or dispensation. On page 124 also, in the book of quotations, paragraph 1100, dice, It says, Notice, through the ages, the same way by his prophets, he has revealed himself. Them wasn't exactly prophets. They were gods. And he writes at the top, the prophets were gods. He said so. For what they spoke was God's word. They were the flesh that God was veiled in. And he draws a star of David. They were gods. Jesus said himself, said, How can you condemn me when I say I am the Son of God? And your own law says that them who the word of the Lord came to was God. See? So, it was God formed in a man called a prophet. See? And the word of the Lord came to this man. So, it wasn't the prophet. Their prophet was the veil. And he writes, the veil. But the word was God. And he writes, in Holy Spirit. And there he also writes, the word equals God. The man's word won't act like that. See what I mean? He cannot act in that manner. But potentially... It was God, see? He was the Word of God in the form of a man, called a man. Notice, he never changed his nature, only his form. In other words, he was still the same God. He only changed his form, that is, his mask, his veil of flesh. Now, he continues saying here, But many people think they know it all. Many people think they are so important that they think that if God is going to do something, He has to communicate it to them personally without using a messenger, a prophet, in whom the Word is made flesh. But God neither pleases nor has to please the pride and demand of the human beings. 
God does not have to do what people say or want God to do. God only has to do what He has promised in His Word. Other than that, He does not have to do anything else because He is not there to please people but to fulfill His purpose, His program, whether people like it or not. And in the message, placed in a Bible study, and uh, they placed an excerpt of the message. Why? Brother Branham says here, and that death tried to anchor its stinger low in that old flesh there. He found out then that there was something different from anyone else as he'd ever stung. That is, the devil. He could sting a prophet and he die. He stung a prophet and then he sing another one. But when he stung that son of God there, it anchored that stinger and pulled it out of him. Today, death doesn't have any sting because the flesh of God caught the stinger and pulled it out of him. The devil didn't know that that was him. He all the time, he said, if you're the son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, do this. And he there writes, The devil did not know that Jesus was the Son of God, the body of flesh of God. He did not come to tell him and please him by saying, Yes, I am. Put a rag around his face, and he seen them visions and so forth. The devil had his agent put a rag around his face like that and hit him on the head and said, Now, if you are the Son of God, tell us who hit you. Notice it's the same thing that happened when he was being tempted. The devil would say to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. See? Tempting him. Because he did not know. And look here, those who were there, also at that time, they put a cloth over him and began to beat him and tempted him. Now, if you're the Son of God, tell us who smote you. The same spirit of the devil that tempted Jesus was the same spirit that they had inside. They were children of the same spirit that was tempting Jesus there in those 40 days. Children of the same father, the devil. Jesus kept that to himself, but he wanted that devil to anchor that stinger, and then he'll take the stinger out of him. Oh, but when he stung him there at Calvary, he hasn't got any stinger no more. He can buzz and hum and make a lot of noise. But his stinger is yonder. Hallelujah. It's anchored in Calvary. No wonder Paul can say, O oh death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh my. When God got ready to try his toxin, he inoculated his own son when they jerked a handful of beard out of his face and Brother Abraham makes a noise like something spitting right in his face. He turned the other sheik to them. I wonder if we've been inoculated like that. When the devil tested him, said, Say, you're a miracle performer. Let me see you heal this one here. Let me see you do this. What will we do if we had the power? We'd turn around and probably do it. Say, see, I told you I could do it. But he was inoculated. It held. He done only what the Father told him to do.
Our brother William continues saying in this message, the word made flesh, he says. Because when God chooses, he chooses forever. But when he rejects, when God rejects and blots a person out of the book of life, that is also forever. Then there is no opportunity for God to say, I blotted him out, but I'm going to put him back in the book of life. They began to understand the things that Jesus said when they were fulfilled. That is why he said, Now I tell you before, so that when they are fulfilled, you already know. You know what you must do at that time. It is like when he said in that same message, I did not bring the booklet, where he put the picture in the message, a 20-year gap, and in the picture he is with his finger, and he says, when all that is happening, look at the picture and say, I had told you so. We can find the picture later on so that you may have it also. And every time you see everything that is going to be happening, look at the picture like he says there. He says, I had told you so. I warned you. Jesus said, they will be offended in me. Peter said, I will not be offended. Jesus said to him, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Jesus also said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Blessed is he who is not offended in the word made flesh, in the word incarnate. Because they were all being offended in Jesus of Nazareth. The priest, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priest. And they were all offended in Jesus of Nazareth, in this prophet. They had not read that he was that stumbling stone. They were stumbling on the stumbling stone and on the rock of offense. Because the stumbling stone and the rock of offense is always the word made flesh. The scripture says, those who stumble with the word, being disobedient to which also they were commanded. Those are the ones who stumble. But notice, those who are going to stumble are already ordained. That is, therefore, not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God who had mercy. Those are the ones who stumble. Those are the ones who are offended because they cannot understand that there is a program already designed, outlined by God, and nothing can be done to change it. Now, when Jesus reached that difficult stage, the main stage in his life for which he had come as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, that was the hardest stage for him. It was the difficult stage where the Lord Jesus Christ said, let us read in the Gospel according to Matthew, Then cometh the Lord Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and began to sorrow full and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. That is in chapter 26, so you can write it down there, verse 36, and on.
And he cometh unto his disciples, and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Our brother William says, When this moment came, Jesus found himself alone. Neither the three main disciples who had gone up with him to Mount Transfiguration, who in the divine program had the main part, they were not with him at that difficult time, although he took them to be with him and to help him in that difficult hour that he was entering. He said on one occasion, The hour is come, the hour of the prince of this world and of darkness. That was the most difficult hour for Jesus, but it was the most important hour in God's program at that time, because it was the hour for which he had come to earth. The three-and-a-half-year ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was insignificant compared to what he was going to carry out in that hour that seemed to be a negative hour, that seemed to be the final moment where everything would end for the Lord Jesus, for the Word made flesh. Notice he only had a ministry of three-and-a-half years. And notice that the forerunner, John, a ministry of six months. Because it is not the amount of time that a person is ministering for God on this planet Earth. It is the work that that instrument came to do on this planet Earth for which God has sent him. And the work that Jesus came to do in that earthly ministry of three and a half years was a great work. It was the work of redemption. And notice that at the end of time, the work that would be carried out would be the work of reclamation, which is the work that God will seal his program with with the resurrection and transformation of our bodies. His program while we are in these bodies. Now notice, he continues saying, little by little, the gates was closing until that moment arrived. Before that moment, Jesus said, no man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. But when the hour came for him to lay down his life, then he began to feel sorrow with the disciples and said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. But when the hour of darkness came, speaking of Judas, he went over to the enemy's side and no one had realized that he had a plan, a program drawn up with the high priest, with the priests of that time, with the scribes and with all those people to deliver for 30 pieces of silver the word incarnate in a man. It was the most difficult hour for Jesus, for Jesus loved him just as he loved all his disciples. Jesus knew from the beginning who of those ministers was the one who did not believe even though he preached as he believed what he preached, but that in the darkest hour of Jesus' ministry he would manifest himself as one who did not believe, as one who was unbelieving, and that no one knew it but the Lord Jesus alone from the beginning. Jesus could not cast him from his side. He kept him close. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He remained by his side until he ate his last meal, which he ate with the disciples. 
which the Lord Himself gave it to Him. It was a very difficult hour for Jesus. It was Jesus' hardest hour. When Judas Iscariot asked Jesus, Is it I, Lord? Jesus said, You have said so. That word was not very easy to come from the lips of Jesus. Jesus was sorrowful in his soul to the point of death, for he knew what was coming. He knew what he had come to this planet Earth for. But it was painful to know that it was one of his disciples who was to deliver him for the fulfillment of that purpose. It was one of his disciples who was to deliver him to be accused, taken prisoner, reveiled, mocked, scorned, beaten, and crucified. It was very hard for the Lord Jesus because he loved them all. And even Judas is carried himself, had his name written in the book of life which would be removed after his betrayal, after the delivery of the Lord, the delivery of the word to be crucified for the first time in all his fullness, 2,000 years ago. He knew what was coming. That is why Jesus said, Let this cup pass from me. It was a very difficult hour. He would say to his disciples, Tonight, you will be offended in me. Now, in this same message, the indictment, it tells us. And also, let us first look at this one. In the message, what will I do with Jesus called the Christ? Look at what it tells us on page 35. And let us see here, he says. How about us? When we see it truly identified that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is here. He is on our hands. He is on our hands. He's on your hands. What are you going to do with him? What will I do with this Jesus that's the anointed Christ? What does it do? How you know it's him? The promise of this day, the day that we're living in, there is so much of the scriptures, say, so many inches of it is supposed to be fulfilled. These last inches of this last day, There is something said in here that's supposed to happen. And here it is. What is it? The same anointed Christ, the anointed word. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to sell it off to the denominations? Are you going to sell it to the denomination? The same anointed Christ. And he draws a cornerstone and an arrow toward the cornerstone and the ages drawn below. Now, what did Pilate do? Pilate tried to wash him off of his hands by saying, the first thing Pilate did was to try to wash him off his hands by saying, oh, he's okay. He's all right. See, you say, oh, poor Pilate. Pilate, a lot of them justify him. No, no, no. He was on his hands. He had heard the message. He has seen the word and he was on his hands and so is he on your hands now notice in the book of the seals what it says there on page 435 because everything is parallel In other words, it is parallel in everything, it says. He had heard the message. And we also see that on page 435 of the Book of the Seals at the bottom. 
Notice the last verses of the sixth seal opened. Those who had laughed at the preaching of the word, of the vindicated word of the living God, when then prophets had stood there and performed miracles, closed the sun and everything else, and all down through the age. See, they cried for the rocks and the mountains to hide them. See, to hide them from the word that they had laughed at, because they seen him come. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. He is the word. See, they had laughed at the word, and here the word was incarnate. And they had made fun of it, laughed at them, made fun of them, and the incarnate word had dropped forth in the angel of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Why didn't they repent? They couldn't. It was too far then. So they know that the punishment, they heard it. They had sat in meetings like this and know about it. See? They also are listening to all these things. And they know that the things of those prophets had predicted was looking them right in the face. The things that they had rejected. They had spurned mercy for the last time. And when you spurn mercy, there is nothing left but judgment. And there is where he writes, Elijah and Moses, he who receives his message, receives mercy. Now notice what it says there. He had heard the message, that is Pilate. He has seen the word, and he was on his hands. And so is he on your hands. That's right. What did he do? He tried to say, Oh, well, he is a good man. I find no fault in him. If that ain't the answer of many today. Oh, there is nothing wrong with the word. I guess it's okay. The Bible is all right, but we believe the church. Our denomination don't agree with it. See? See? There is one class of people trying to wash him off his hands. Those are the ones who cast the stone and hide the hand. I find no fault in the word. It was okay for the apostles in their day, but we live in another day. We don't live in the apostles' day, so therefore, I do not have to do like the apostles did. I don't have to be baptized the way they were. I live in another day. I don't have to have the things that they had. I live in another day. The Holy Ghost was just given for that bunch. Hebrews 13.8 Put him back on your hands again. Brother Abraham knocks the three times the pulpit. No escape. He is truly vindicated. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You have no escape. You can't pass him off to some other age. Hebrews 13.8 condemns your thoughts and put him right back on your hands again. So, Jesus is in your hands, just like on Pilate's was. Look, you say, but I don't know. Well, why are you listening for? In other words, look, you say, but I don't know. Well, why are you listening for? Pilate was a pagan. His wife was pagan. But God, to make it just, sent that woman in there and said, don't you have nothing to do with this just man? She said, I suffered this day. Of course, it was morning. It was over the night. And one twenty-four hours is considered a day. I suffered some dreams tonight of that just man. Don't you have nothing to do with it. And he also speaks to us in this other message where we stop here for a moment. On page 33 on the message Look Away to Jesus 
Look, he speaks to us also about this, he says. Pilate looked one time when they brought him. He had never seen him before. His hand tied, blood running out of his back, a crown of thorns on his head. Pilate looked and was convinced because a horse come galloping down the street and a rider jumped off and run over and said, Here's the wife has sent you a letter. And he looked at it and she said, Pilate, my beloved husband, have nothing to do with that just man. For today I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. He trembled, his knee beat together, and he said, If you are the Son of God, if you are the King, why don't you speak out? Are you the King of Israel? He said, You have said it. Said, Tell us the truth. He said, Jesus, to this end I was born. And Pilate marveled. All, everybody was begging and crying at his feet. He said, I have power to kill you, or I have power to release you. He said, You have power of nothing, lest it be given to you of my Father. Whoa. Brother Branham did said that. Sir, he was convinced that that was more than a man. And he draws a cornerstone. He was truly convinced that he was more than a man. Certainly he was. But what? His politics and popularity was too great. See, he turned him down. His popularity was too great. The politics, his position in life, was too great to accept this fanatic. Wonder how many pilots will be listening to this, that your position in some denomination will be too great to accept the real Lord Jesus standing in the position that he is today. The Roman soldier at the cross looked on Jesus. After the earth had had a nervous prostration, shook till the rocks rung out of the mountain, and the sun went down in the middle of the day and turned dark. The stars didn't come out to give its light, and the earth burst forth with rocks and an earthquake, and the zigzag lightning sweep the skies and ripped the temple veil from the top to the bottom. And he writes, the veil of the temple ripped by lightning. And the people running and screaming, they didn't know what had taken place. And that Roman soldier that helped nail him there had punched the sword through his heart. Then he looked, but it was too late. He looked and believed, but it was too late for him to believe. What he had done had sealed his doom. He had run the spear through the Savior's heart. It was too late. Now notice where Brother Branham tells us In the message, living, dying, buried, rising, coming. Five words on page six. Notice, he says, When the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, came to take the place of guilty sinners and was mashed and bruised and scuffed and made fun of and died a death that no creature could die except God himself. And his bloody locks hanging from his shoulders dripping to the ground, 
expressed what a horrible thing that sin is. When he had to die to redeem man from a life of sin, nothing could die like that. Nothing could stand that death. He said that when they pierced his side, that there came forth blood and water. It's been some time ago I was speaking to someone about this, and it was a scientist that said, there is only one way that that could have happened, and it was not because of the Roman spear that he died, and neither was the loss of blood that he died, because there was still blood in his body. What he died of was not because of the Roman spear or the nails that was drove in his hands or the thorny crown they placed on his head, because he died of grief, because he came to his own and his own received him not. He died of a broken heart when he knew the very creatures of time that he would die to redeem had spit in his face and he was rejected of man. David, 800 years before it happened, cried with the very voice that he cried at Calvary, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? What a terrible thing that sin does. It separates man from God. And he was the sin offering that had to be offered for our sins. And he was separated from the presence of God. Sin has separated him. God placed our sins upon him, and he was separated from God. And that's why he cried, Why hast thou forsaken me? And because he was forsaken and had taken this place and seen his people, that he was come to be their Savior and to offer them life. They have rejected him. And it grieved him so till... He was so brokenhearted until the blood and the water and the chemicals of his body separated. Man will never know what that was. That's the reason there could be no one else could ever die like that. I don't care how much that you could be tormented, how that they might put your feet in stocks or saw you, by inches, or burn you by inches. You could not die that death, because your makeup is not like that. He had to be God. He had to be more than a man. And to think that God died, He died of a broken heart, with such a grief for the world, until chemical reaction taken place in His body that could not take place in you. You cannot suffer like that. There is no way for you to have that kind of grief. So there is only one could do it. And he did it. Now he continues saying here, I am in Look Away to Jesus on page 34. I wonder how many Romans today has done the same thing and will do the same thing. You might look someday, but it might look too late. Many of today will come in that day and be the same way. They have known. Brother Wood here yesterday saying this just because it's in, the, in this message. Down here at the Slider Company, a Roman Catholic sitting there. He went down to get some concrete for the church here. And when he did, he told him where he wanted it for. And the Roman Catholic said, Is that Brother Branham? Yes. He said, I'll say one thing. When he prays, God answers. See? Wonder then, knowing it, Seeing the vindication that it's truly the gospel, not me, any man representing Christ. It's the word we're talking about, not man. 
and there he draws the ages and the cornerstone and an arrow in each one of them up to the cornerstone as well. What am I trying to say? Is this that they see the clearly and vindicated word like Pilate and the rest of them did, like the Roman soldier. But are you going to wait too late to do anything about it? He should have used the spear the other way. The doors will be closed, like it was in the days of Noah, and then it's too late. You might wake up some morning and say, I intend to get out of this mess. Don't wait too long. You had better look and live now. Luther looked away from the Catholic denomination. What did he see? A pillar of fire. He saw an independent church. Wesley looked away from the Anglican denomination. He saw the same thing. That is the pillar of fire. The Pentecost looked away from all the denominations. And what did he become? A great, mighty people. What did each one of them do when the founders, Luther and Wesley, and them, and when they looked away and saw what they did and started out, their children, coming behind them, look back to where they come from, out of the denomination, and took that group of people right back into the same mess that they come out of. What are you looking at? The founders look right, but the people following them look back to what the founders come out of and done exactly what the founders was against, the anointed one of God. You know I got to hurry because I got a prayer line coming and I know many of you has to travel. One day, I took a look. I saw the Word made flesh. I saw the Alpha and Omega. I never seen any three, four, or five. I saw one. I saw Him as my Savior. I saw Him, the Word. I saw Him, the Light. I saw Him, the Mighty God. I seen God in Him. I saw the pillar of fire. I saw in Him exactly what the Bible said He was. I saw that he was the Alpha and Omega, that he was the pillar of fire. He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. I saw that the pillar of fire said to John, his never-failing presence, as he said in John's over there, and his never-failing presence will never leave you. Brother, my opinion tonight, and there he says that he sings a song, a short hymn, Look, what do you see? Do you see deliverance? Do you see what he is? Look through the word and see what he was. Then you look through the same word and see he is the same today as he was then. He is the anti-type of the brass serpent in the wilderness for the same cause, sin and sickness. Judas took a look one day, and when he looked, after he had took a real look at him, he had only been looking at their treasure before that, the pot of money they had. But one day when he looked and seen Jesus, you know what he seen? He seen he was guilty. He seen that he wasn't fit to live, and he hung himself. One morning, one of the greatest morning in this all history of time, in closing, I am saying this. There is something happening in the Jerusalem, and all at once, a bunch of soldiers came down to the jail. I can hear the jingles of the chain, hear them dragging of the spear on the street. Who is back in there? Barabbas. He's ready to die. He's a thief. 
He's now good. He's a robber. He's a murderer. He's going to die. First thing you know, he said, well, this is all of it for me. I'll be executed this morning. The first thing you know, the guard opened the door. Step out, Barabbas. He stepped out and said, well, I guess this is the end, he said. Barabbas, you're absolutely free. What? I'm what? I'm three dots. Absolutely free. You're free, I said. Said, how can I be free? He said, well, come here. Barabbas, look up there. You see that man dying up there? He took your place. I wonder if we all tonight could look and see what Barabbas saw. Someone taking our place. He was wounded for a transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes I was healed. You were healed. Wonder if we, the guilty ones, who should be sick, can see in him our deliverance? You who should go to hell, see in him your freedom, your path to heaven. Wonder if you can see what Barabbas saw on that day. He said, a little while, and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. Oh, church. Then if he said, you shall see me, it's proof that you can look again. And he draws a cornerstone and an arrow toward the cornerstone and the ages. You'll see me for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. When? How do you see him? At the word. And from there he draws another arrow up to the cornerstone. He is the word. Look at the word and see what the promise is. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was when he walked in Galilee is the same thing he is tonight in Jeffersonville. The same thing he is at the Branham Tabernacle. What did you look to see? A founder, a denominational man? You never see it in Jesus. Do you look to see some great priestly? You never see it in Jesus. No. How do you see Jesus? By the word of God being made manifest because he was the manifested word of God. Now, it is also there in Isaiah where he tells us on chapter 45, Verse 20. He tells us. Verse 21, it says, Tell ye and bring them near. Yep, let them take counsel together. Who had declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and Savior. There is none beside me. Look upon me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, Every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall man come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. 
Now notice, we're going to continue here where we left off. We made about three pauses here. In What Shall I Do With Jesus Called Christ? Let us continue here on page 36. Around here when his wife tells him, I suffered some dreams tonight of that just man. Don't you have nothing to do with it? Now he said, well, then if that be so, I'll just wash him off my hands. But he couldn't do it. Neither can you. Once you hear the truth, you've got to accept it or deny it. No way. Yes, sir. That is, you have to be either cold or hot. As I said in an excerpt, you cannot be lukewarm. You have to do it. Warning of the Lord. The Jews screamed out, Let his blood be upon us, for we would believe our priests, our denominational system, before we would believe in him. There you are. See the classes today, but all must face God's issue. You've all got to do it anyhow. Pagan or whatever you might be. Unbeliever, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, lukewarm, cold, hot, and whatever you might be. You got to face the issue just the same. Whether you want to or not, it's on your hands. It was so at the first coming and so is in the second coming as well. That's exactly. Then, there are those who try Pilate's other scheme to dodge the issue, pass him on to some other Caesar. See, Pilate said, now wait a minute, I don't want nothing to do with it. He's a just man. I don't want nothing to do with him. Oh, I believe what I have heard. I've never seen him do miracles, but there is too many witnesses for him. I believe he's a just man. He's a good man. See, but I don't want nothing to do with it myself. I just wash him off of my hands. Bring me some water. You'll bear me record here. Yep. But God was bearing record too. Do not think that God is not looking at everything. He has everything well written down. He was in his hands. And so is he on your hands. See? You know what I'm talking about. See? Not only you, but this tape. He's on your hands. What are you going to do with him? This Jesus called Christ? Christ is the anointed word. See? What are you going to do with it? It's the message of the hour. The day is here. Truly proved by the Bible and by God. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to dodge the issue now? How are you going to get by with it? He's on your hands. And Oswald's case will be a minor one to yours. Thou minister or whoever you may be. Them Jews were priests and rabbis, teachers, holy men. But he was on the hands just the same. He was the word, the issue of God for that day. And they failed to see it. Just the elect saw it. The ones that believed it. Now, all must face the issue. In every age, it's been so, every time. Through the age of Eve and Adam, on down to the age of Noah, on down in the time of Daniel and Bethsazar and Nebuchadnezzar, on down into Christ's time, on down into the very hour we're living. It's been the same. The issue of the Word has come forth. Not their creed or not the denomination, not the dogma, but the issue of the Word has been against those things. So now, 
it's on the hands now. Then, those who try Pilate's other scheme to rid him by passing him off to somebody else, Pilate said, Now, you know what? I'll just get him off my hands. I'll wash him off my hands with this water. So, I've got to do something with him. So, what will I do? I'll send him over the headquarters with the bishop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they tried to do today, see? They sent him to a Caesar. That didn't take him off Pilate's hand. Take him off of nobody's hand. What did it do? It backfired on him. Comes right back to the individual. You say, well, I would, I would do it. I would accept it if my denomination would accept it. Your denomination is in the Council of Churches condemned. And he writes, the denomination is condemned. How are they going to receive it? It backfires right back to you. It ain't what your denomination says. It's what do you say? They've rejected it. Now, what are you going to do with it? That's the next thing. See? That don't take him off your hands. He is truly a vindicated. He is truly identified. The word of this hour. And he writes, Elijah and Moses and Elijah. The promise of this hour. Not the promise of Luther's hour. That was it then. That was the word in the Reformer's age. As you all who had heard the seven seals. When the reformer age went out, the beast with the face like a man organization issued, but this is the face of the eagle, the beast that went to make the challenge today. And who would dare to say that wasn't the inspired word of God when he foretold it here and sent out yonder to Arizona and brought it right back, even with science and everything else, and prove it so? This book is already open, that's right. Just waiting for the seventh seal to be identified of the coming of Christ. And there he writes, the seventh seal equals the coming of the Lord. All right, he's on your hands. You got to do something with him. Don't take him off. Yes, sir. In this category, I'd like to say, pass him on to somebody else. If my denomination would accept it, Brother Branham, I'll accept it. But you see, my mother belonged to this church. She lived in her age. That ain't you. It's you now. Look what she had to come out of to be what she was. What about you? And he writes, some say, if my denomination would accept it, I'd accept it. All right, look, you say, my mother was a Pentecostal. She did so and so. She come out of the organization. But I'm trying to talk to you now. What about you? See, in this category, we find many educated. Now, I know I'm going to hurt feelings here but I do not do it intentionally. If I do, then I should be down at the altar, repenting. I'm saying this in godly love. And now we continue here. Let's see where we left off in the Word Made Flesh. It says, This night ye shall be offended in me, in the hour of darkness, in the hour when the prince of this world would manifest himself against Jesus and would take one of Jesus' disciples to carry out that work of darkness. Jesus said, Tonight you will all be offended in me. Jesus said, quoting the words of the Old Testament, 
you will all be scattered. You will all leave me tonight, for I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. That night, when Jesus went and prayed, he, because of the very difficult time he had already begun to go through, he said, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Let it not be in this form or way that is moving on the scene. Let it not be in this way that I have seen in the scripture how it's going to happen. It was three times. But he always said, But not as I will, but as you will. That is, if there is no other way, then let it be as you wish. But if there is any possibility that this thing that is going to happen may be changed, and that it may not happen in this way, then I wish for it to be changed. My soul is very sorrowful in this hour, but it could not be done otherwise. If this cup cannot pass from me without my drinking it, that will be done. Jesus had already surrendered himself there to what was going to happen at that hour. He made no more resistance. He no longer prayed to prevent what had been forged and planned against him from being fulfilled. He fought no more. See? When he told them, wake up now, the one who is going to deliver me is coming. Now notice how they had forged everything. They had had their meetings, their plans and everything to carry out that which culminated in the crucifixion of Jesus. But all of that was already in his program. Those who were already ordained for that, they were there. In other words, the stage was all set. In that great drama, in the theater, as we read in these days, Brother Branham says that the ones that were being prepared for the rapture were there, and also the villains were there. But the coming of the Son of Man is not only for the East, but the West also has the promise of the coming of the Son of Man shining like the lightning. And just as the Son of Man manifested Himself in His first coming in the East, and there those prophecies, those scriptures were fulfilled, so it will also happen with the fulfillment of the coming of the Son of Man in the end time shining like the lightning in the west to manifest himself as the lion of the tribe of Judah, which manifestation and the purpose of that manifestation will be fulfilled, carried out, in the darkest hour through which the word will have to go through in the man in whom that word will become flesh in the final days. The promise for the final days, as said by the forerunner of the second coming of the Lord, of the coming of the Son of Man in the West, in his fourth seal message, he says, But when our Lord appears here on earth, he'll be riding on a snow white horse, and he'll be completely, fully the Emmanuel, the Word of God incarnate in a man. Book of the Seals, page 303. Many people want to be preachers of the Word of God. Many want to be ministers. Many want to be prophets. But I advise no one to seek to be a minister, much less a prophet, because upon whoever the ministry of true prophet falls, which will be on earth in the last days, because although there are many false prophets, there will be a true one in whom the Word will become flesh in order to fulfill the promise of the coming of the Lord as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, King of kings and Lord of lords, in whom that ministry will be in the last days 
will be a person who will suffer greatly as the darkest hour approaches, similar to the hour in which the Lord went to give his life as the Lamb of God. And notice, in whom that minister will be in the last days will be a person who will suffer greatly. And they are still saying, let Brother William come to fulfill all that. In other words, they want him to come and suffer. That's how much they love him. When he comes in his glorified body, he will be to be with us from 30 to 40 days and to go in the rapture to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He is not coming to suffer. That person will suffer greatly, just as Jesus suffered. Emmanuel, the man who was the Word made flesh for that time, for that dispensation. When Jesus saw that his own followers, those who had believed his message, were going to be offended in that dark hour, and that his own disciples were going to flee, and that one of them was going to betray him, for him, that was a very dark hour, a very fearful hour, and the equivalent to the manifestation of the Word made flesh as the Lamb of God will be the Word made flesh as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It will have to be so in this end time, in the darkest hour that is approaching, so that the judgment may come upon the kingdom of the Gentiles, may come upon the nations. Notice, so that the judgment can come, look at what has to happen. Now, notice on page 36, in this same message, the indictment, he says, notice this, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Let us go further on to advance a little bit more. In page 38, let's go page 38. It says, and we have here several more notes. Let's see how much time we have today. Let us turn to page 38. It says, Now, what did they do? They didn't know it. Today, men walk ignorantly. They don't know that that's the truth. They think it's some kind of a ism. They don't dig down deep enough to get into the spirit of revelation. And he writes, the spirit of revelation. They don't pray enough. They don't call upon God enough. They just lightly take it. Oh, well, I believe there is a God, sure. The devil believes the same thing. The devil believes it more than some people claim to believe. The devil believes it and trembles. People just believe it and go on. But the devil trembles, knowing his judgment is coming. And people believe it and don't pay no attention to the judgment is coming. Guilty of crucifying him. Sure, I indict this generation, finding them guilty by the same word that found them guilty at the beginning. That's right. Jesus said, Who can condemn me? He was the word made flesh. And today the same word is made flesh. Peter said in his indictment in Acts, Let's just read it. Peter, when he saw this taking place, what they had done, the Spirit, look, Peter was defending Christ. 
what they had done. I'm defending what the gospel are. I, Peter, was indicting them for killing the man, Christ, who was the Word. I'm indicting this generation for trying to kill the Word which is made manifest in men. There is another place. Let us see here. Our brother William continues saying, This will happen in the West. The Word will be crucified again in its equivalent at this end time. And when that happens, remember one thing. It will be at the stage of the ministry of the Lion of the tribe of Judah to carry out a great work according to the divine program. See, it is the stage of claim. He comes to redeem us. That is to transform us, what he wrote there. On page 416, I believe, of the seals. 4.16 And just about the time the Antichrist move himself fully on the, on the scene, God moves. And he writes with Moses and Elijah, he'll sell fully on to redeem it all. And he writes to transform us. See, just run, just write together. And they're both side by side, Cain and Abel. The crow and the dove on the ark, Judas and Jesus. After the manifestation and message for testimony to the souls in prison who will be living on earth, for hell, the fifth dimension will open on earth. But there the Word made flesh will enter to give testimony, to give the message of divine judgment, to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. So it will be in the end time. And so it will be through the person where the Word will become flesh in the end time in the West to shine like lightning. And what we do not understand in those days and in that hour, because the eyes of many will be blinded to what will be happening. What you do not understand in that hour, you will understand it after that difficult moment has passed. We have to be very steadfast in the Word, in the Scripture that corresponds to our time, in the promises, in the prophecies that correspond to this end time. Because in this end time, the Word will be crucified again in an updated form, not with literal nails, nor in a literal cross, but rather in a modern way and in the message this same message the indictment on page 40 it tells us let's see now yes sir call to repentance and my indictment now This new Calvary is the church, so-called most holy places, great pulpits, Catholicism altar, Catholic altar, called their pulpit, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Pentecostals, the most holy places, there he receives his hardest pierces, a new Calvary. A new Calvary. Where is it found at? In the holy places, the church. Where is he crucified at? From the pastors. You hypocrites. You know better than that. 
I'm not angry, but something inside of me is steering. God has been truly identified among you. Where did he get his spears at in his side? Where did he get his pierces? On Calvary. Where does he get it today? In the pulpit. Where did they come from? Jerusalem. Remember that there is the Jerusalem there in Israel, the earthly one, and there is the heavenly Jerusalem. Where do they come from? The denominations. And he writes to the side Jerusalem, and he writes the church. The ones who claim to love him, that's who did it. That's who does it today, his second Calvary, where he receives his pierces against the word. And he writes, they have crucified him today, equals the pastors. That's what pierces him. Who is he? He's the word. He is the word. Where is he pierced the hardest from? The pulpit in the holy places. Just like it was then. I've got a right to indict this generation. I've got a right to do it. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ with his signs and proving that he is God. I got a right to bring indictment against this generation because his hardest spears points has been right from the pulpits where they've criticized and said, don't go out to hear that stuff. That's of the devil. Right in the place that's supposed to love him. And the very signs that Jesus said would take place The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. The Word, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it's called the devil. Where from? The pulpits, the holy places. Oh God, how can he look down? Just mercy, that's all, grace. We can't do nothing else but head for judgment we're already there and he writes the word in flesh think of it his hardest pierces comes from the pulpit that's where his new calvary is at they crucify him the word at the pulpit that's right how how they do it by their forms of godliness that's exactly And there he writes, forms of godliness, crowned from the audience by scoffers. He's got a new crown of thorns, scoffers, pierced from the pulpit, crowned by the scoffers. Is he crucified again afresh, striped by man-made creeds, teachers, of denominations against his word, they stripe it. In shame, condemn it. And he writes, they strip the word. Jesus said, in vain they worship me. In vain. Don't do no good. Who do they worship? They worship the same God. They was worshiping that same God at his first crucifixion. And it was vain worship. They think they're worshiping God and that worship is in vain. It's the same thing today. In vain they built these denominations. In vain they built these seminaries. In vain they have these creeds teaching for doctrine the commandments of men and denying the word of God. They're guilty of crucifying the prince of life teaching man's doctrines for his word. In vain they worship me, stripped, pierced, crowned. When you see that, go down the street, and some of you ladies with long hair say, 
She's old-fashioned, isn't she? Remember, that's scuffers. That's the crown that you're wearing. God said it was your glory. Wear it with pride. Hallelujah. Wear it with pride. As you would wear a crown of thorns for your Lord. Wear it with pride. Don't be ashamed. He said so. No matter what these Jezebels say today, what these impostors stand in the pulpit, crucifiers of Christ, no matter what they say, you wear it with pride. God said so. You keep it. Crowned with scuffers against thorns. Pierced from the pulpit with creeds. He got a new Golgotha where they take him to. These robe cores, short wearing woman, bobbed hair, painted face, singing in the core like angels with talent. That's his new Golgotha. Just modern strip teases protected by a law, like at Sodom and Gomorrah. Further on, On page 42, it says, You poor intellectual, spiritual deprived, rejected upon your own grounds. You read the same Bible that any other man can read, but you've turned down the Spirit of God till the Bible said you've been given over to a strong delusion to believe a lie and be damned by it. You actually believe that you're right and the Bible says that you would believe it and be damned by the same lie that you believe to be the truth. Therefore, I indict you by the word of God. You are teaching the people an error and crucifying the principles of Christ, of holiness and life above. And he writes, they are handed over to spirits of strong delusion. Now our brother William continues saying, he says, The prophet forerunner of the word that would become incarnate in all of his fullness said that the cruelest punishment is public punishment. That punishment in which they publicly put the word to shame to make people believe that it is not the true word of God made flesh in a man, but that it is a false prophet of the many that have been on earth. This is the same thing they did with Jesus 2,000 years ago. They made the people believe that he was a false prophet, a crazy Samaritan, and that by the finger of Beelzebub he was doing all those things. When that hour comes, which is at hand, we will see a repetition of what happened there. We will see the equivalent. Jesus said, But woe to the man through whom the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of sinners. It was better for him not to be born. When Jesus gave the wet bread to Judas Iscariot, the Scriptures says that after the morsel, the devil came in. Judas was no longer with them, for he was planning the delivery of the Word made flesh. Judas was not with Jesus in that difficult hour in which Jesus said, My soul is very sorrowful. Father, if you can pass this cup from me, pass it. Judas was no longer there because he was planning the delivery of his master from whom he had learned the message that corresponded to that time, who had taught him the message that he had to preach at that time. He had already finished his ministry and was going to begin another one with the anointing of the Prince of Darkness. When Judas 
took the morsel that was given to him after the peace the devil entered and anointed him, blinded him. And Judas did everything that was written that one of those who ate the bread and put his hand into Jesus' dish would do. Thus it was written, and thus it had to be fulfilled, according to the divine promise. And when the equivalent to those things in the coming of the Son of Man in the West are fulfilled, we will once again have a parallel picture to the one of that time, but updated. What shall we do with Jesus, who will be manifesting himself through his last messenger on this earth? What shall we do with the Word made flesh in that difficult hour, which the Word made flesh will go through? What shall we do in that hour? It has been said before. For when it happens, be not troubled, said Jesus in his Word. This is the Word of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what will happen at this end time. There they placed the picture. I don't know if it's that one. Because I had another one too. It seems they used two pictures in that booklet. However, that's one of them. You can use that one. Where he was preaching. I think that was the message. If you can confirm to me a 20-year gap. And there is another photo also where he's on a desk. And they also use that photo. That's the one of a 20-year gap. This, these were the pictures they used in that message, which he referred to in the Word Made Flesh, preached in June. And a 20-year gap was in March. In other words, when he preached the 20-year gap, then they were looking for the photo to put it in that booklet and in the message in June he preached the word made flesh and he tells us there about the picture and he continues saying I'm in the word made flesh this is what will happen in this end time But after that manifestation, after that difficult moment, the resurrection of all the saints will come. And the transformation of all the elect will come. That is why the Lord said, He that shall endure to the end, he shall be saved. He shall be transformed in this end time. Because he will have persevered until the end, even though the circumstances have been contrary. In the message, Returning Home, preached on January 6, 1985, Maturin, Venezuela, it says, When those ministries of Moses and Elijah begin to speak to us, they will be speaking to us the Word, the revelation of Jesus Christ, revealing the book of Revelation, the revelation of the thunders, where the rapturing faith is, where the faith to be transformed is. Therefore, when those ministries are giving us that revelation of this book of Revelation, when those ministries are making known to us what the thunders spoke, they will be giving us what we need to be adopted, to be transformed, and then raptured. This is what will bring to the children of God from among the Gentiles the updated ministry of Moses and Elijah. That is what God sent those ministries for. And the promise of the adoption of the children of God will be carried out. In this same message that we have been reading the indictment on page 50, It says, I say it on this tape and for this audience. I say this under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Who is on the Lord's side? 
Let him come under this word. God will surely bring this wicked, Christ denying, Christ rejecting generation into judgment for blasphemy. Unto judgment for blasphemy, the crucifixion of his identified word. They are coming to the judgment. I indicted. Who is on the Lord's side? Said Moses. Let him come unto me. When the pillar of fire hanging there as an evidence. And who is the one suspended here as evidence? The pillar of fire. Each one saw, as we read, Luther saw the pillar of fire. Wesley saw the pillar of fire. Brother Branham saw the pillar of fire. And where was the pillar of fire seen? In a great tent cathedral. There is where one has to look. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him take up the word. Deny his creed and follow Jesus Christ daily, and I'll meet you in the morning. And he writes, The identified word equals Malachi 4.5 and Revelation 10.7. And he also writes, I will meet you in the morning at the rising of the sun, Moses and Elijah in the east. And further down he says, God may many find their way to the Word of God, the only way of life, for He is the Word. I pray for each one, Father. Sometimes in saying these things, it's not in cruelty, it's in love, because love is corrective. And I pray, God, that the people will understand it to be that way, that it is meant to be corrective. And he writes, love is corrective. The way of life equals the word. You who had to correct and prayed for them at the cross, saying, Father, forgive them. They, they're blind. They, they just don't understand what they're doing. I pray for them ministers today who is crucifying the word again by taking their creeds and denominations and dogmas and substituting it for the word of life. And then, before the people, they criticize the real truth that God is vindicating to be His truth. And our brother William continues saying here, those same ministries, being ministries of and for adoption, in whom those ministries are in, he will also receive the adoption, and therefore, he will be able to do all the worldwide international signs in heaven and on earth. That Revelation chapter 11 says, and that Revelation says in other places. And then, he will be able to face the challenge of this hour. He will be able to face the beast and the image of the beast, which are pointed out in the book of Revelation. And in the message, turn on the light. Notice what he says here. On page 17, this great council has moved around to unite all the Protestants together. This ecumenical move, and what is it doing? It's blackening out the very word itself. And the word is Christ. How can they do? when the Christian science and united brethren and many of them people in other great organizations, some believe the virgin birth, some don't. 
Some believe this and that. How can you join yourself with unbelief? How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Come out from among them and be separated, and take God's holy word and stay by it. Jesus Christ is obligated to manifest His word. The thing we need today is a rising of Malachi 4. Another prophet will rise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and will produce exactly what he promised to do. And he writes, another prophet will rise. Then man blindly will forsake it and walk right into the darkness as they always did. And he writes, Jesus Christ is obligated to manifest his promised word. Watch now, we find out the same cause that today that they reject, the churches reject the message, crucify the word, take the word out. Now, if you don't belong to it, you can't even have your church. They'll close it down. You've got to come into it. If you don't do it, you're closed down. Then, what about it? Oh, stand for that which is right. Remember, it's crucifixion time again, nearly. Now notice, in, he spoke of this to us in the Philadelphian age. in the Book of the Ages. On page 313. It says, on page... 313 because you have taken my word and he writes kept and lived it and thereby become patient I will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, here again, we see the overlapping of the two ages. For this promise has to do with the end of the Gentile period which culminates in the Great Tribulation. And he writes, the extension of an age overlapping another. And he writes, the hour of temptation at the end. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. This verse is not a declaration that the true church will go into and through the tribulation. If he meant that, he would have said that. But it said, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, This temptation is exactly like the temptation in Eden. It will be a very inviting proposition held up in direct opposition to God's commanded word. And yet, from the standpoint of human reasoning, it will be so very right, so enlightening and life-giving as to fool the world. Only the very elect will not be fooled. The temptation will come as follows. The ecumenical move that has started on what seems such a beautiful and blessed principle, fulfilling Christ's prayers that we all might be one, 
becomes so strong politically that she bears pressure upon the government to cause all to join in with her either directly or through adherence to principles enacted into law so that no people will be recognized as actual churches unless under direct or indirect domination of this council. There he writes to the side, the hour of temptation and the ecumenical council, like in Eden. Little groups will lose charters, privileges, etc., until they lose all property and spiritual rights with the people. For example, right now, unless the local ministerial association approves in many, if not in most cities, one cannot rent a building for religious services to become chaplains in the armed services, hospitals, etc., It is now almost mandatory to be recognized as acceptable to the Trinitarian ecumenical groups. And this pressure increases. And it will, what the squeeze, it will be harder to resist. For to resist is to lose privilege. And so many will be tempted to go along. For they will feel it is better to serve God publicly in the framework of this organization than not to serve God at all publicly. But they err. To believe the devil's lie is to serve Satan, even though you may want to call him Jehovah but the elect will not be deceived. And he writes, by believing the devil's lie is to serve him. That is the devil. Furthermore, the elect will not only be kept, but as this move becomes the image erected to the beast, the saints will be gone in the rapture. And this little delightful winsome movement that started out in fellowship in Ephesus will become the monster of Satan that defiles and deceives the whole world. For the church system of the Roman Catholic and the Protestant in coming together will control the whole wealth of the world system and force the whole earth into its religious trap or will kill them by refusing them the privilege of buying and selling, whereby they would make a living. This will be accomplished simply, for the harlot's daughter are all but gone back to her. In the meantime, Rome has acquired nearly all the supplies of gold. The Jews have the bonds and all the papers. At the right time, The harlot will destroy the present-day money system by calling in all the paper and demanding gold. With no gold, the system falls. And something is moving. And I saw in the news that something is moving in some countries uniting so that the dollar does not have value. And you can then find later in the news, without gold, in other words, they have to do something to back it up or support it. With no gold, the system falls. The Jews will be trapped and come into the alliance, and the harlot church will take over the whole world. All of that is what is prophesied that will happen. Now notice, our brother William continues saying here, and it does not matter if the image of the beast or the beast kills any of those who are adopted. Being adopted is like putting them to sleep and then waking them up. 
Now notice, in a writing on a Bible study on the back side, he writes, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and he writes there, Christ, our Passover, has already been sacrificed for us. And he writes, it is repeated in the church and will be repeated when it is being revealed to Israel, 144,000. Remember Revelation 11. He goes on saying, because just as Jesus being immortal, for he said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down for myself. John 10, 18. He laid it down willingly, and after three days, he took it up again. He arose calmly, and after 40 days, he said, I must go, and departed in a cloud. And also in the message, the indictment on page 53, it says, Bless, he says at the end, bless these people here. Bless these people here. I pray that you, I pray that you will give them, Lord, a consecrated life. Many of them, Lord, are good people. They're your people. They just haven't known the truth. And I pray that you will show them thy truth, Lord. Thy word is truth. This was after everything he spoke. As you said in John, I think about the 17th chapter, you said, Sanctify them, Father, through the truth. Thy word is the truth. And It again, thy word is still truth. It always is truth because it's God. And I pray, God, that you sanctify them through the truth. That is, sanctify, purify them from all creed and denominations. Purify them from all worldly things to a consecrated life of the word and he writes sanctify them from creeds and denominations and draws a star of David there is a writing a day like today on April 22nd of 2011 that Friday fell on Good Friday. That was in Villahermosa, Mexico. That subject that he preached there was Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he wrote at the top part. He writes, Ministers, along with your congregations, pray a lot for me and for the ministry, and for the believers in your congregations. We are in a very difficult stage. In dangerous times, says Paul, the squeeze is near. But there will be a great blessing for the believers and a divine judgment for the world and the foolish virgins and the Jews. Notice how on that day, as we have also seen during several years, both the day of the triumphal entry and the day of Good Friday and on Sunday, Resurrection Day, he wrote certain things there that showed us the same things that Jesus went through 
in that difficult time, which was showing what it would be in these final days. And that writing is good to place it on a bookmark so that we always have it at hand. And on page 55 of this same message, the indictment, he says, May there come forth a revival of the just and a great power come among the church just before it's going. It's not hard to pray that because you promised it. And we're looking, Lord, for that third pool that we know that will do great things for us in our midst. I am yours, Lord. I lay myself on this altar just as consecrated as I know how to make myself. Take the world from me, Lord. Take the things from me that perishable. These words, make them part of you also. Give me the imperishable things, the word of God. May I be able to live that word so closely till the word will be in me and I in the word. Granted, Lord, may I never turn from it. May I hold that king's sword so tightly and grip it so closely granted Lord and with that sword in hand we can continue marching forward toward the promised land of the new body well let us stop here and we are going to have the message that we are going to have for today. And I do believe that the song that was sung a moment ago of Psalm 103, that psalm, there is a part that Brother William, for sure he told some others, But he told me personally when he had a very strong pain and was reading that psalm, he says that when he read, Who healed all thy diseases, he says that that stood out. And he grabbed that word and he was healed instantly. Notice with the powerful hand of faith we can take hold of those promises and make them ours and if there is any difficulty any problem whatever it is you believe it take hold of that word and you will see how that which you are asking for is going to happen but we have to ask so far it says you have not asked says Jesus but when you ask you will notice that whatever you ask the Father, I will do it. I will give it to you. In other words, I will answer that which you are asking for. Just ask with faith, believing. If you can sing that song, who was singing it? You can sing it while I'm gathering up here. Give me a little time to pick up my books. Those who were singing that song, that psalm, may come forth and then we will move on to the message the mystery of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and that psalm speaks to us of that work 
that he did, that he performed. Psalm 103. You can sing it. We stand up to stretch a little bit and then you can follow this psalm and it is in your hands in the Bible. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that it is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who sanctify thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth. all thy diseases who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who sanctify thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Amen. May you all be rejuvenated with us, our beloved brother and friend, Dr. William Soto Santiago.